Um, I went straight into this because, as, um, as Maureen said, I have a fair bit that I'd like to say, but I want to try and say it in the, in the 20 minutes or so. Um, so, uh, the title here is about Teaching Post Editing uh, Proposal for Course Content Revisited a Decade or So Later. And the reason for that is that in uh, 2002, um, I had presented and published a paper at the European Association for Machine Translation, or EAMT, workshop on teaching machine translation. And this 2002 paper presented a proposal for course content for a post-editing uh, module for integrating into a translation studies curriculum. At the time, there was a, a growing demand in the industry for post-editing, but it was really only getting started, I think, around 2002. And as most of you know, now there is an even bigger demand for post-editing in the profession. Um, so many, many uh, companies, especially in the area of localization, are now using machine translation, being asked to use it by clients, and uh, translators are being asked to post-edit. Um, for some people, it's maybe about 20% of their, their workload uh, on an annual basis. For some people, it's almost 80% of their workload on an annual basis now. So it's, it's very topical. It's still very much a problematic issue in the industry, uh, post-editing, um, getting people to accept the task of post-editing. And so it's very topical. And I'm asked quite a lot about training and why aren't we training people um, uh, why aren't more translation graduates uh, willing and able to post edit and so on? So it's good that we're discussing that today. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask today about this paper from 2002 is, is it still relevant? And um, does it need complete revision or just a little bit of tweaking? And in particular, I was interested in hearing what some industry players have to say about post-editing training and about the skills required in 2014. So what I did uh, was I went out and just informally asked some industry players about their attitudes and what uh, feedback they had on post-editing training. So I'll talk about that uh, shortly. But in case you're not familiar with the paper, in a nutshell, um, what I proposed at the time was that post-editing, um, the skill sets required are basically the skills required of a translator and extra skills on top of that. Now, in the meantime, people have asked, you know, are post, is post-editing a different competence to translation? Um, should we be training post-editors and training translators separately? And those questions are very open. I don't have answers to those uh, at the moment. At the time, though, I thought, well, first you have your translation skills, and post-editing requires some additional things on top. So, for example, knowledge of machine translation. So what, what does machine translation do? How does it work? But by that, I also meant knowledge about what happens inside the black box, not just what is machine translation in general and how does it work, but really understanding the mechanisms within the MT system itself. Um, I propose that the post editor needs terminology management skills, but specifically for dictionary coding at the time for rules-based machine translation systems. I'll come back to that in a little while. Also, they needed pre-editing or controlled language authoring skills in order to um, make the source content ready for machine translation. And programming skills, or specifically, knowing how to write macros. And this particular um, skill was inspired by the most successful machine translation application at the time, which was the Pan American Health Organization. And there are several papers by Muriel Vasconcelos and some of her colleagues, which uh, <laughs> described how they wrote macros to automatically correct some of the typical problems they saw in the raw machine translation output. And finally, um, the paper proposed that there would be text linguistic skills as part of this course as well, in particular for helping the post editor with uh, problems about coherence. Um, in general, the paper proposed that there should be a theoretical component, so um, maybe not theoretical, but at least um, meta knowledge about machine translation, about controlled language, about terminology management, but then also practical components, which would be essential. 
confidential. Um, and they would focus on post-editing for different types of content, for different levels of post-editing, so so-called light post-editing or full post-editing. Um, also, uh, different interventions in the machine translation system, so um, maybe coding dictionaries, for example, at the time, and writing um, macros that would help to fix some of the typical problems that are appearing in machine translation output. So is that paper still relevant? Is this proposal for course content for post-editing still relevant today? So what I wanted to do was find out, well, what does the industry think about this? Um, because there are the people who are saying, um, we need more post-editors, we need, we need you to train more, more post-editors and more um, post-editing skills. So I sent some informal requests um, for thoughts on the paper and on post-editing training in general to a number of different uh, organizations. So there were three multinational publishers, McAfee, Symantec, and PayPal, four language service providers, Athen, Lingo24, Sagen, and We Localize, and one machine translation developer, Canton NT. And I asked them for feedback on the paper as it stands well, from 2002 and how relevant it was to date. So I'm telling you a little bit about what they said. So one of the things they said, um, and I agree with completely, is that knowledge of MT is required even more than ever in 2014. Um, and this is especially the case in, since the emergence of the statistical machine translation paradigm. So with rules-based machine translation, it was fairly obvious what was happening to uh, the source text and how the machine translation was being produced. So you had rules that were encoded and you had terminology that was encoded in the dictionary. With statistical machine translation, it's much um, less clear what's happening. You throw a lot of data at a system, you train it, and you keep your fingers crossed and hope for the best. Um, that's on the, on the surface, at least. So the more that a post editor or translator knows about how a statistical machine translation system works, I think the more competent a post editor they will be. PayPal, for example, came back and said that they would stress particularly a module about machine translation technology. Knowing what to expect from different systems will make post-editing more effective. And uh, Canton MT said understanding retraining of the engine, which is uh, normal in statistical approaches, and its importance and how often it should be done is something that would be very beneficial for post-editors. So then on to terminology management. So um, I've been given some feedback, basically terminology management is no longer um, appropriate or relevant in as an SMT paradigm. That this was relevant for rules-based machine translation, but not really anymore. But I don't really agree with that because I think that terminology management is still um, very important. That one of the big issues in machine translation is um, correctly translating the terminology. Um, so understanding the terminology management process in general in the, in the translation process I think is still very important. Knowing whether or not a term produced by a machine translation system is trustworthy or not and how you can determine that is also very important. Then there's always issues in terms of consistency in terminology between translation memories, machine translation output, and official glossaries. So the post editor needs to be able to assess that. And we're now coming into a situation where um, while the rules-based paradigm was parked for a number of years, it's now coming back into the picture again because statistical machine translation hasn't been able to really um, improve the, the quality level substantially over the last number of years. So people are now turning back to rules-based machine translation in conjunction with statistical machine translation to try and bump the quality levels up even higher. So again, terminology management and dictionary coding and so on in rules-based systems and hybrid systems as they're called, I think is essential. The same question um, arises about pre-editing and controlled language. Um, so again, this made a lot of sense in the rules-based approach where you could author the source text so that it was better processed by the rules-based engine because you knew what the rules-based engine was going to do with the linguistic rules that were encoded. 
again, these days people say no control language, pre-editing, it's no longer relevant with the SMT paradigm. Uh, Symantec, for example, who have implemented controlled authoring with a rules-based engine, they came back to me and said, well, this is a nice to have kind of skill. Um, it's good to know about it so that the um, authoring, <coughs> uh, the post editors can feed back information to the authoring team about what's going wrong in uh, machine translation. But definitely uh, this, old, this um, adage of rubbishy and rubbish out still applies in the SMT uh, paradigm. So um, last week I spent some time in a in company observing um, post editors at work actually and asking them about their attitudes towards post editing. And the main complaint that they all had was about the quality of the source text. Um, so as far as they were concerned, their job was made much more difficult in, in post editing because the source text wasn't always of a very good quality. So I think um, knowledge about pre-editing, preparing text for machine translation is still very much relevant in uh, the SMT paradigm today. And translators who have a skill set regarding being able to spot issues in the source text and feeding that information back to machine translation developers have very valuable skills, as far as I'm concerned, anyway. So what about programming skills? So um, again, I mentioned the Pan American Health Organization and how they described writing macros to fix very typical recurring problems in uh, machine translation output. You would think that this is not really relevant um, anymore because a lot of the machine translation implementation is done in conjunction with translation memory. So repetitive errors should actually be caught in the translation memory, updated and then you know, fixed forevermore. Um, but not everybody is implementing MT with translation memory. And last week, for, for, for sure, I was able to observe the uh, post editors fixing the same mistakes quite regularly in just a set of 200. Um, so if they were able to uh, write uh, some kind of macros or scripts that would semi-automatically fix some of the recurring problems, I think that would be of benefit to them. I don't think that this is necessarily a skill that every post editor actually needs to have, but you might have some uh, guru post editors, for example, who would be able to spot recurring errors and uh, fix these quite uh, automatically in output which perhaps then might go to regular post editors uh, for working on. Um, PayPal uh, suggested, in fact, um, in terms of programming languages, they even went so far as to say, I think you should be teaching Python and not Perl because Python is more user-friendly as a programming language. I'm not sure if anyone in this room has the skill sets to teach Python, myself included. <laughs> but um, it's certainly something that we could encourage people to do if they were interested. And I think it is a skill set that um, translators who work in machine translation um, would find very valuable um, in, in the working environment. So looking back on this proposal about text linguistic skills, I, I thought to myself, well, really, you know, in retrospect, I think text linguistic skills are a subset of the translation skill set. So maybe that doesn't really belong in this proposal for uh, a course on post editing. But at the same time, there are some developments in machine translation that I think will cause headaches in terms of text linguistics. Um, these, some of these are introduced just by use of technology in general, like translation memory technology, where we're focusing more on the segment level and less perhaps on the text level, um, and therefore coherence perhaps is compromised. But there are other things happening in machine translation. So for example, the so-called MTM matching, which stands for machine, uh, machine translation memory matching. So if you uh, think about a translation memory fuzzy match, the idea is that the bits that are not translated in the fuzzy match would actually be pulled from the machine translation system. So phrases will be translated by the MT system within the fuzzy match that also comes from the translation memory system. So now you probably will have issues uh, regarding coherence or cohesion, at least on the sentence level, that the post editor would need to be very um, aware of and be able to pick up on. And the other development is that much of the um, machine translation implementations that I'm aware of 
is actually translating user-generated content. And user-generated content comes with lots of issues like typos, grammatical errors, cohesion coherence issues, and so on. Um, so if the source text has those problems, you can be guaranteed that machine translation will also have those problems. So um, looking at cohesion and coherence during post-editing, I think, is still very much um, essential. So while it is, I think, a, um, a part of the translator skill set, post-editors need to be made quite aware of uh, the issues around cohesion and coherence because of what the technology is doing. So um, in asking uh, the industry stakeholders for suggestions and feedback and so on, I asked them if they could propose any enhancements or were, was there anything in the, in the original paper that perhaps needs to be covered these days that's not uh, actually covered in that paper. So Sajin, for example, came back and said that for current translators who are working in the marketplace, that it would be very helpful to teach them how to transition from the traditional translate, edit, proofread process to post-editing. Um, so this is maybe beyond our remit if we're teaching in universities, but it's certainly something that uh, companies are struggling with. If the existing translator base um, they're finding it very difficult to get people to transition to post-editing for obvious reasons as well. McAfee and Sage both came back and suggested that we should focus on um, helping uh, students to identify the post-editability of the segments, um, which I would also call the how long problem. So identifying how long you should look at a segment um, in order to ascertain can I fix this through post-editing, or should I just delete and retranslate? So if you spend a long time thinking about it, and then you still have to delete it and retranslate, you've wasted quite a bit of time. And time is a big issue in terms of, of uh, the translation industry. Um, so honing your skills so that you can immediately identify whether a segment is post-editable or not appears to be something that the, um, the industry feedback I got anyway suggested. Lingo24 suggested um, we should help people to establish the link between post-editing effort and the quality levels required. Um, so with machine translation and post-editing very often you get instructions such as please post-edit this so that it is fit for purpose or good enough quality which of course is very subjective. <laughs> Um, they expect maybe then a light post-edit, but translators uh, will do a heavy post-edit. Or sometimes they expect full publishable quality, uh, but they're told to do a light post-edit. So there are uh, mismatches between expectations and actual post-editing, uh, which people are struggling with. Semantic, in relation to that, also suggested that we should teach how to translate guidelines or expectations into level of edits required. And I think that's something that's quite difficult at the moment. And Alvin made an interesting suggestion about getting students to audit each other's work um, in order to learn about over-editing and under-editing, which are quoted as frequently as problems uh, in the industry. Another suggestion was to include um, some uh, information about productivity measurement techniques, which are becoming very, very common these days. So we can have a whole other workshop probably talking about the ethics of this, um, which I won't uh, get into today. We probably should organize something <laughs> to do with ethics and machine translation. But definitely, um, companies are now automatically monitoring the productivity of their post editors. Um, Sometimes they're doing that through keyboard logging. Uh, sometimes they're doing it through edit distance measures after the fact. So trying to measure <coughs> the distance between the post-edited segment and the original machine translated segment. So I think that um, our students need to understand what are those productivity measurements? How do they work? How accurate are they? Uh, so they have at least an opinion about how these things are measured. Lingo24 said, we consistently find the phenomenon that translators say it would have been faster to retranslate while we measure hourly output rates that they would not have reached otherwise. And this is a very common uh, thing. So translators will, post editors will always say, 
I would have been faster translating this, but actually the keyboard logging evidence uh, contradicts that. And an interesting proposal was how to training people how to rapidly switch states from human translation to fuzzy match editing to machine translation editing, which describes what happens now in the translation memory environment when machine translation is introduced. And I think that is something that's cognitively quite demanding, which is probably why translators are saying it, it's very hard work to post edit. <coughs> Another suggestion was to um, include information in a course about the tools that are frequently used for post-editing, and Pingo24 uh, mentioned Chasmacat for some reason uh, specifically, uh, but certainly the tools are now being um, enhanced to monitor post-editing activity. More, I think, in the research environment still at this point in time, but probably we will see that having an impact in the production environment eventually. What wasn't mentioned, but probably should be included, I think, is the whole issue about pricing. So teaching students how to price post-editing work. So what's a fair price for, for post-editing, and how do you calculate this? How do you monitor your own productivity uh, versus what you're being paid for, for the post-editing? And another suggestion would be to include uh, training in terms of how to give structured feedback on machine translation. So this is very a very valuable skill from my point of view. Um, it's something that's highly required from machine translation developers. Um, but the feedback that they often get is along the lines of, it's very bad. But they can't do anything with that kind of feedback. Uh, they need very specific feedback about exactly what is the problem from a linguistic perspective. And then perhaps they can do something about that when uh, they retrain their engines. Um, but that kind of feedback, I think, is very valuable from a commercial perspective. So um, we should perhaps be teaching people how to give uh, good quality feedback, but also what's a fair price for that feedback, because it is very valuable, I think. So in summary, um, I, I think and hope that the original proposal actually still seems to be quite relevant. Um, what I haven't touched on here is what kind of module you have for post-editing? Is it a standalone module? Do you integrate it into a translation practice module or into a translation technology module at undergraduate level or postgraduate level? Those questions are still quite open, I think. Some aspects have become maybe less relevant due to changes in the machine translation paradigm. 